It is good to be here with you this morning. Again, as um, Pastor Tom said, my name is Mark Hagen. I've got my wife, Jessica, and my three kids, Wes and Brody and Annika. We drove down. We call that drive from Ryandell uh, to, to uh, Creston here. We call it the corkscrew because it is literally like this. And the former caretaker used to work at the harbor, uh, Nils Anderson, if you knew him, he once counted the corners from Creston all the way to the harbor. I think it's 362 corners all the way up. And so if you struggle with any form of motion sickness, let me tell you, that gets amplified pretty quickly on that drive. So my kids are all still kind of uh, recovering from their dad's white knuckling coming down the road this morning. So it's great to drive it on a Sunday morning because nobody's on there. So I feel like I get like my little V6 RAV4 and we're just like, this is Formula One coming down. It's a lot of fun. So for me, not for them, but. <laughs> Anyways, it, it is good to be with you this morning. I'm gonna open with a word of prayer. And then we're going we're gonna to jump in this morning. Father, I thank you that you are here with us this morning. And that, God, you reveal yourself as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God, this morning as I share, would the reflections of my heart, Lord, be an encouragement to the group here this morning. God, may we see you. May we hear you. May we encounter you. Open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, open our hearts to receive that which you would speak this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Recently, my family and I got to go on a trip to Disneyland. Now, if you've been following along with our, um, with our story at the harbor, the, the first two years have been like the equivalent of jumping out of an airplane and like you got to hit the ground running or you're just going to face plant. And so it has just been this insane amount of work where we've been not only like doing construction projects, then we've we decided not only let's launch a young adult discipleship ministry, let's launch an outreach coffee shop ministry simultaneously. That sounds like a good idea. And we've just been going absolutely nuts. And so finally, it'd been like two years. We hadn't had a holiday, really. And it's like, okay, we need a break. Let's pack up our family. Let's drive down in November and camp all the way down to California. I was going to be preaching down at a church there. And let's take our kids to Disneyland. So first night we get into uh, it's Morrow uh, um, in Oregon, so you always joke, where are you going? We're going tomorrow. We're going tomorrow. So we, we're camping in Morrow, uh, Oregon, in, a, in literally a farmer's field, and it's cold and it's rainy, and of course, my style, we pull in late at night, it's dark, then the furnace doesn't work. And so we're cold, we're shivering, and, and, and I'm in this foreign country, in this field, and I'm out like trying to diagnose what's wrong with my camper and it's like a brand new camper we've used like twice so I'm pulling the furnace apart 11 at night and I've just driven all day and finally we get this thing fixed and then we we make our way down we had a few other crazy adventures along the way but we finally make it to California and so we had been dreaming of this trip for a while and uh, you can go to the, the next slide there whoever's running that and so this is us and we got to go to Disneyland. I met fake Walt Disney, the statue of him and Mickey. And, um, and it, was, it was an incredible experience. Now, I didn't know this going to Disneyland. There's actually two parks down there. There's the original Disneyland, and then there's California Adventure, which is part of Disneyland, a separate park. So first day for Disneyland, we did all the research and we knew exactly where we're gonna go, what days. I mean, it was funny because when we're driving to California, it looked like it hadn't rained there in like five years. All the rivers are dry. It's just, it is like full on desert. And then the morning that we're supposed to go to Disneyland, I wake up and I don't know if you've been following the news, California has been getting like atmospheric river after atmospheric river. They've just been getting absolutely pummeled with rain. Well, we started that for them. Like uh, it began Tuesday that we're going to Disneyland. We wake up, my phone dings and it's like flood alert, ding, wind warning. And I'm like, are you like we are paying like two thousand dollars for tickets to take our kids and i'm gonna get rained out are you kidding me so anyways we we go there and i don't have a video of it but like we're standing in line for this one ride and it is like where's noah and the ark because like we got to get out of here we're gonna float away it is just there's rivers running down the paths it is absolutely nuts and we got to go on the uh thunder mount ride if you're not familiar with that it's like this train kind of roller coaster and we're in the train station ready to go on and there was kind of a break in the rain and i was like oh good like maybe we'll get this ride and not get drenched and so we're standing there and the people in front of us get on they get on the train and they go on the ride <laughs> The skies just open up and it is like, it's like a sheet of rain coming down and they pull into the station and this poor lady, she has got makeup everywhere. She's in an honest state of shock. She kind of pulls in, she's just like, 
And I'm thinking, and I'm paying money for this? Like, this lady's going to need, like, 10 years of therapy to work through what just happened in this three-minute ride. Oh, man. And we got on it. We just had a blast. So day one was awesome. So we had a great time in the rain, and we had a lot of fun. And, and day two, we go to California Adventure Park. Now, California Adventure is part of Disney. And we, 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 we get in there, and the rides we want to go, of course, it's the off-season. We're in November, so a lot of the rides are down for maintenance. And we, we get on, we wanted to go on the Cars rides, and they're not available. So walk around, there's this Avengers campus, and oh, there's this Guardians of the Galaxy. This ride looks like it could be fun. I don't know what it's about. It's as big, it's the biggest building at Disney, Concrete Tower. And so we get in the lineup. And now, a lot of the rides we've done at Disney have all these warning signs, right? Like, if you're pregnant, you shouldn't go on this ride. If you're, you know, you know, motion sick or all these things. Like one ride, we went on the Indiana Jones ride the day before and like literally spooked out Jess and Annika. They didn't come on it. They're so scared with all the warnings, okay? So we're kind of anticipating, if this is a scary ride, we're going to be warned, okay? So we're in this line for Guardians of the Galaxy and kind of they do this little preamble and, and you kind of walk through. Disney's really great at making the lineups really entertaining. We finally get to our turn to go on, and we've had, like, no warning. We have no idea what we're getting into, okay? Now, I'm just going to preface this. The words I would not use to describe my wife and kids, adventure junkies, thrill seekers, love, like, big drops and crazy rides, those are not words I would use to describe them. So we get in this ride. We lock in, and I'm sitting in the row behind him, and all of a sudden the car goes straight back and locks. And then this little video comes up, and it's the Rocket character from Guardians of the Galaxy, you know that. And all of a sudden, it's just a little silhouette of him, and he's talking. All of a sudden, he rips wires, and then he's like, let's get this party started. Boom, we drop 10 stories straight down. And then, then we shoot up 12 stories, and it's all black, and we're sitting there, and then the car starts going, and then the, the gates open, and, and it's like, and all of a sudden, you don't know, and all of a sudden, we shoot up another three stories, and then boom, down 14 stories. And it's like, like it's the, the ride is the equivalent of you're in an elevator shaft, and someone goes like this for three and a half, four minutes, okay? So I actually got a picture of this moment, because of course they snap your picture. So um, this is us, can you go to the next slide? So that's a close up of my family. So there's Jess in the bottom left, my daughter Annika, me, the only one that's enjoying this is my son Brody, he's the one that loves these kind of rides. At one point we get up and they go right to the top of this building, the gates open, and they snap your, this when they snap your picture, and then the character's like, hey, is that Disneyland? You can see, like, almost the ocean from up there. And Jess, and, and, and Jess turns around to me, and she's like, we are not doing good. <laughs> and I, I can't do anything. I'm locked in here, and then boom, down we go 12 stories again. And it's like this right. And, and anyways, and there was this one point that lady sitting to the right, she's trying to reach over and console them. And we drop and her arms go up and they're crying. So Jess in this moment is crying. Like she's actually crying. She's not having a good time. We get off this ride and we're like, what just happened? And so we go and we walked around the California Adventure Park for about an hour, just processing the trauma that we had no idea we were walking into. And I mean, I'm trying to redeem the situation. I'm saying, well, guys, like, to be honest with you, there ain't no ride that gets worse than this. Like, <laughs> like none of them are, this is the scariest thing I've ever been on. And it was just, it was, it was nuts. It was pitch black. And I found out after this ride used to be called the Tower of Terror, if you're familiar with that. They, and they rebranded Gardens Gardens Galaxy. like, okay, that would have been helpful, actually, in the lineup if it was called Tower of Terror. I would have not taken my family on this ride. And so the rest of the, so then we're always like waiting, what's the bait and switch here on every ride? So we get on the Little Mermaid and it's like, okay, when, wh when's the drop happen? What, like we're, we just, we've lost all trust here. And so the reason I share this story with you this morning is because since we've gone on this, we have just been retelling and remembering these stories. And this morning I want to talk about remembrance and not just remembrance, but particularly as a little kid, one of the things I used to always ask my dad is why? Why, why, why? Like as you figure out the world, right? Your question is why? Like, why do we need to go to church on Sunday? Why is that something we need to do? Why are you going to work? Why do you need to do that? And so this morning, I'm gonna ask the question, I'm gonna be that little kid, why do we need to remember? Why do we actually need to look back? Why do we need to remember Guardians of the Galaxy, Tower of Terror experience? Now, I've often been described, if you hang around with me long enough, I've been described as a visionary. Um, being a visionary means a kind of a posture of looking ahead, right? We're always kind of looking to see what could be, but what isn't yet. 
And these are gifts that have served me well as I'm working at the harbor. We're planting a young adult discipleship school as we've decided to get this building that was given to us. If you know the story of Roe Coffee, which by the way, we love that you guys serve our coffee here. Thank you so much for your support in doing that. I mean, we really named the coffee green tree to kind of force your hand to, to make you buy the stuff. Um, but no, we really, as, as we did that, like having vision to see, like even with my board of directors, when we're pitching this idea is like, you're, you're saying we should take this church building that the community gave us and fix it up and turn it into a coffee shop? What? But like being a visionary served me well and it has just been an unbelievable success what we've been doing out of there. I mean, recently we held, um, we held a Christmas Eve service there and the relationships Jamie and Jacob have been building, which by the way, Jacob's our head roaster. So if you do like the coffee, you can go talk to him. If you don't, maybe just don't say anything. <laughs> But if you really enjoy the Green Tree Coffee, Jacob's the guy that roasts it. But we had this Christmas Eve service and we had like over 40 people come. And like half of those people, you never see donning the doors of a church. It's been incredible what God has been doing through this, this little ministry. And then we've launched our Young Adult Discipleship School, which has been, it just as a fascinating fact, oh, I was down at a conference in, in the US and they threw out a stat that over 50% of young adults are not only just leaving the church, they're leaving the faith. It's like, whoa, okay, God, what's going on here? And so we, to have vision to see, rather than like, well, as the numbers decline, maybe like, this probably isn't the pool we should be swimming in, but no, no, we're going in for it. We're gonna, we're gonna go, we really, really wanna do, um, really work with young adults and disciple them. But the, my vi gifts as a visionary have served me well in doing these things. But one of the things as a visionary, it's not natural to wanna stop and look back, right? It's like, hey, we're blazing forward. Let's go ahead. And so for me, this is, we're going to do something this morning that's not a natural thing that I normally do. And that's, we're going to look back. We are going to remember. Now, every year we celebrate a holiday that's actually called Remembrance Day. What do we do on Remembrance Day? I like interactions. So like, please, like, if you, if you want to, if you want, like, just shout it out. What do we do on Remembrance Day? Honor soldiers, yeah, yeah. So are you were saying something over here? Yeah, yep. There's also even a tomb to the unknown soldier. Are you guys familiar with that? That we go and lay, we go and lay wreaths on Remembrance Day to remember the person that we don't even know who they were, the sacrificed for us, right? Why is it important that we do that? So again, as we begin this morning, I want us to sit with this question. Why do we need to remember? Why do we need to look back? Now, a lot of you guys probably don't know my story particularly. You know, like, um, I went to Disneyland. I'm up at Ryandell and uh, doing this ministry. But for years, I actually lived in Alberta, and I was a farmer. Okay, so I worked at a Bible college there, Canadian Lutheran Bible Institute, which actually in 2014 came through and did a concert here at your church uh, on their spring tour. But I was on staff there. I, did the, I was the director of worship. I was director of operations, director of missions, director of everything it felt like. But um, I, 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 was, I was working there in a three-quarter time. And in addition to that, I thought, you know, when we moved to Alberta, hey, like, I grew up on a grain farm in Saskatchewan. Why not start farming here? This sounds like fun. And um, I learned a lot of things. And... Um, you know, I, 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 always, I always say, like, as a grain farmer, like, if you want to, well, it's like this. If you want to grow in patience, do you know how you grow in patience? I don't know if you guys, maybe this won't land well with you guys, but we live in Ryandale, so we are tied to the Kootenai Lake Ferry, okay? And every spring and fall, like, in the, in, the, in the off season, they go to the one ferry, right? And you just got the one ferry and one sailing. Well, one of the worst feelings in the pit of your stomach is when you pull up to that ferry terminal, and not only did you miss the ferry, but it's the little ferry that's only operating because they're servicing the big ferry and it's a two ferry wait. How you grow in patience is you wait in that ferry terminal for four hours, which we've done multiple times. That's how you grow in patience is, is actually having to wait. But you know how you grow in faith? You farm. That's how you grow in faith. You put thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, like I think my uncle, like last I talked to me, he's putting over a million dollars of seed and fertilizer into the ground. And then you just wait. Because there's nothing you can do at that point. Like we're not in irrigation country where I farmed. We're in dry land. So you really trust the Lord to bring the rain. And so you sit there, you watch, and you trust 
that the rain's going to come at the right time, the sun's going to come at the right time, everything's just going to work out perfect, and you're going to get that bumper crop at the end of the year. Now, one year in particular, I remember really, really well, and that was the year of 2019. Um, I had gone uh, all wheat that year. Um, I don't know why I did that, but I just went all wheat on all my crops. And um, we had like unreal rain that year. Like it was phenomenal. And this crop just went crazy. Um, oh man, we just had so much. I had so much grain. Um, we, we filled all our bins and then we put like a 10 or 12,000 bushel pile of grain on the ground. It was just massive because I had nowhere to store this stuff. So I just dumped it on the ground. It was, I remember 2019 because it was a phenomenal yield year. But I also remember 2019 because that was a year we just about lost our farm. Um, now, the, there was a mixed blessing in that rain, right? Because the crops grew so huge. Like I just, I had, I, green trucks were going nonstop trying to keep up to the combine. And we had this big pile on the ground. But the other problem was is that the grain never really dried. Now, I'm not for sure... You guys might know this because it's more of an agricultural community. But one of the things you don't want to do with grain is put it in a grain bin when it's wet. And you know why that is? Because it starts to sprout and grow. Because it's got the essential moisture. What you need to do is you need to get wheat below, you know, I think it's 14.5% moisture content. I'm going from memory or 14. Around there, 14 to 14.5%. You want wheat below that to store it in a, grain, in a bin so it will not start to sprout and grow. And so I had this big pile on the ground and I'd bought in this grain dryer and I'm, I'm like drying the grain. And of course, I want to get the stuff on the ground done with first because one of the ways you get paid on wheat also is based on the quality, the color of it. And so the more it sits outside, the more it's going to bleach. And so I'm working through this 12,000 bushel pile. We finally get through it. It's late December. And then I get into my first bin now. Okay, so I've done the big pile on the ground. I'm drying the bin. And as I'm drying the bin, I've got the auger in the bin. It's going up to the dryer. All of a sudden, and, and again, if, you, if, you've ever, if you've ever experienced rotten grain, it is one of the smelliest, nastiest experiences of your life. It is just awful. And I'm, I'm, I'm augering, and then also, like, it, 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 when, when grain starts to mold in the bin, it gets really, really hot because that seed starts to germinate, right, which creates a vast amount of heat, and it has nowhere to go, and so then it starts to rot. And so I'm filling the dryer, and, I, and all of a sudden, the auger's running, but nothing's coming out of it. Well, that's weird. Okay, so I hop up on top of the dryer, and the dryer's not running. I'm just filling it. And I just like, oh, that smells really bad. And I reach down, and this stuff is like lava hot, this green, and the dryer's not on. So I go up, and I crawl up inside the bin, and I take a look inside. And this was part of like, this is actually one of the only photos I have of that experience because I was, I call that hell week for me. I, our sewer froze. I'd bought a brand new iPhone at that point. I was fixing our sewer line and bloop, down the sewer it went and I lost my iPhone. And so I was able to kind of recover this photo. But as I looked into the green bin, I used to have a picture, but the whole thing was, I call it a tower of mold. And this is what I found in my bin. All the green in that bin was rotten. Like, I don't know if you know what weed is supposed to look like, but it's not supposed to look fuzzy like that and, uh, and rotten and moldy. Now, my kids and I were recently talking, um, and, you know, you, you talk about things as, as, as family, and we're, we're kind of recalling, when's the last time you've seen Dad cry? <laughs> right? Well, when's the last time? Because um, Mom cries more than Dad. Like, that's just the truth in our family. Like, just, you know, no, no shame. Uh, it's just the reality. And the last time the kids could remember me crying was this incident because I came, I went up there and I was totally overwhelmed with the smell out of the top of this green bin. It, it actually, it smelled so bad. The thing was hot. And I just went in and I cried because even though that year had been phenomenal, this is like, this is a lot of money. This is forty or $50,000 of green I've just lost. I can't afford that. I don't farm big acres. I'm working at a Bible college at that time. And let me tell you, a quick rich scheme is not working in ministry. So we're not making big money. I, I, I need the farm to supplement what I'm doing there to help go. And, and I've just lost like almost a quarter of my whole production that year in this one bin. And so I just, I broke down. I, I, was, I was crying and, and just overwhelmed. I... I yeah, it, it was honestly, it's, it's still even hard to remember that because it was such a hard time. I, I read that we read the passage this morning. Thank you, Tom, for doing that, by the way. That's a really hard passage to read through because it feels like it just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper 
and more hopeless, hopeless, till we kind of get to that point where it pivots. But there's this path, the one line that always sticks out to me is in verse 20. And it says, I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Now, scholars, when we read this passage this morning, scholars traditionally ascribe the book of, of Lamentations to the prophet Jeremiah. Do you guys know what he's lamenting as he's writing these words? Are you familiar with what he's lamenting over? It's the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay? So the Babylonians have come in. Now, you have to understand, for, 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 for Israel, like, their identity is tied up, for them, they believe, is in this promised land. It's all about the promised land. Now, if there is like an epicenter of the promised land, that epicenter is Jerusalem. And if there's an epicenter of Jerusalem, that is the temple. That is God's manifest presence amongst them, right in their midst. Like we saw when Solomon dedicated the temple, like it's like crazy stuff going on there, like God in the midst of them. And so when Jeremiah is writing this passage, he is talking about, not only the loss of life, but the loss of identity. This is who we are. That the very core thing to who we are is being attacked here. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. And I'm not going to get into the details. Like, you can go research what happened, but it's not pleasant. Like, not even movies can, can do justice to what the Babylonian siege looked like. And then years later, when the Romans invaded, it is not a good time. I want to ask a question this morning. As you think about what we've been through these last few years, do these words resonate with you? I mean, we have come out of a hard time in COVID, right? Where we haven't maybe been able to see friends and family. We, we're kind of past that now, but it's been an awful hard period of time. If we're going to get really honest this morning, look around and who's missing from this congregation that used to be here? Can, can we just get honest this morning? I don't think any of us will ever forget this awful time as we grieve over our loss. Or maybe something else is going on in your life. I mean, last night, I, I got a message from a friend who I haven't really talked to in 18 years. And he's turning, I, I mean, it was so out of character. I, I don't know what's going on in his life, but I only thing I can, I, I just turned 40, by the way, like last year. And so, you know, when you go through 40, most people go buy a Camaro. I moved my family to Ryandell. That was our midlife crisis. But, uh, you know, my, my friend, I think he's actually kind of going through, what am I done with my life? He's at this point of like looking back, like, what have I done with my life? And, and he's kind of starting to like lament and grieve where he's been in his life. So again, these words resonate, resonate with you. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Now, I'm thankful that the story doesn't end there, right? Like our story in Lamentations, it's not like, well, life sucks, then you die, and then end of story. You know, no, that's not where it ends. And I actually find the prophet Jeremiah's, like I, I'm reading from the NLT, New Living Translation, and I find this, I love, I love how they put it in here. So it's like, I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss, yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The unfailing love of the Lord never ends. His mercies, we have been kept from complete destruction. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each day. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. Again, I want to come back to this question. Why do we need to remember why do we need to look back? Now, I want to go back to my story of the rotten grain, because my story actually didn't end there. Um, I'm going to admit not all of my life experiences have gone this way. Uh, there are things I'm still walking through that I've not go gotten deliverance from. But this is one of those really, really cool stories. And this story was not one of those ones that ended that way. So again, I'm overwhelmed, right? I'm in the house, I'm crying, the kids are there. I'm overwhelmed with grief, shame, and fear. Um, grief because of just like grieving the loss. Shame because I was a newer farmer in the area and you know, farmers talk and so you're probably gonna be, oh, of course that was gonna happen, Mark. What did you think was gonna happen? Like you, you needed to get on that sooner and, and then just fear of honestly like, oh man, we're done. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna lose this farm. So. 
we're at this moment of like, I'm just sitting there, I'm wallowing, I'm crying, I'm weeping, and there's nothing I can do, right? What else can I do in that moment? It's too late, it's too far gone. The grain is already molded and rotten. So I called my family, my mom and dad over, and we went, <laughs> it just sounds really weird, but we went and laid hands on the bin, and we prayed for it, okay? So we laid our hands, prayed on this grain, prayed on this bin, and then I went and, and that was late at night, and then I went and tried to go to sleep. And um, I mean, I didn't sleep a wink. Like I was just, I was feeling just awful. So finally, the next morning comes, I kind of waited for it because I really didn't sleep and go outside again. And I opened the door of the grain bin. And if you can go to the next slide, this is what I saw. Now, again, I don't know if you know what wheat's supposed to look like, but this is what it's supposed to look like. Perfect, beautiful grain with no mold, no rot, no damage. And in fact, I sold every bushel that year, and I didn't have one bushel that I lost. Now, my brother-in-law is an agrologist. Had, uh, for many years, he worked for, used to be called United Grain Growers, and it became um, uh, AgriCore United, and then became Viterra, and he had a grain farm himself. And he came over and looked at this, and he's like, I can't explain it. I don't know what just happened, but this is not what I've ever seen happen. I've never seen, because he saw it in its rotten state, and he saw it in this state. It was just a complete miracle. Why do we need to remember? I need to remember this story. Because I'm going to be completely honest with you, as we've stepped out at the harbor, it has been hard. We've had moments where we're doing this young adult discipleship school, and just even a few weeks ago, I sat there and I thought, oh God, should we just quit? We have one application. I got a board of directors on me saying, we better, I don't know if we can operate this. And I, have I moved my family, a province over to do something? God, have you called us to fail here? Is that what you brought us for? I mean, I have just needed real moments of faith. And then I remember the grain. And I remember that I've been through worse. And I remember that God has brought me through more. That he hasn't left me there. You know, I resonate with the disciples in Mark 4. You know, when they're in the boat. And the waves are coming. And you see these waves. And you are overwhelmed with fear. And yet I also recognize Jesus' posture. What was he doing in that moment? He was sleeping. He was asleep in the boat. Why was he asleep in the boat? Was it because he didn't care? It's because he wasn't worried. That, that, that started to become a question I ask myself now is like, is Jesus anxious about this? No, he's not. He's asleep in the boat. Wake up! <laughs> you know, sometimes I would be like, wake up! Now, I mean, kind of a cool thing on our harbor front, we've had two more applications come in. We have a lot more excitement. But there was like two weeks ago, an honest, like this is me getting, so if you know me, vulnerability is not on my high list of things I love to do in a corporate public setting. Here, I'm going to spill my heart out to you. Um, but I'm just being honest with you. Two weeks ago, I wrote in my journal, should we close this and pull the string? And I just really felt God calling me to know, you need to actually go all in. To use a poker metaphor, all the chips are on the table. I'm all in on this. And why am I all in? Because I've been through things like this before. Why do I need to remember? I need to remember God's deliverance. Because it's not like, oh, I've been through one hardship. Perfect. That's my test for the rest of my life. I'm never going through another hardship. Boom, I passed it. Let's be honest. It's like wave after wave comes. But the waves don't get smaller. But my fear does. Because I'm now beginning to trust that Jesus is in the boat with me. That's how Jeremiah, reading Lamentations, can say, I will never forget this, yet I still dare to hope. I have been and seen awful things, yet I still dare to hope because I have seen God also deliver and do miraculous things. So why do we need to remember, guys, this morning? Why do we need to remember? Number one, we need to remember because when we walk with Jesus, no matter the circumstances we find ourselves in, the unfailing love of God never ends. And by his mercy, we are kept from complete destruction. We need to remember 
Because when we actually stop and look back, he has never left us. He has never abandoned us. He has been with us all along. Second thing, why we need to remember. It is when I stop and I remember this story that I'm brought to gratitude. And I actually really think gratitude is the key to life. Coming into a room with a posture of thank you. I mean, the Psalm in, in Psalm 100 and verses four to five says, enter with the password, thank you. Make yourselves at home talking praise. Thank him, worship him. For God is sheer beauty, all generous in love, loyal always and ever. Enter with the password, thank you. What if this church became known in the Creston Valley, you became known for as, hey, that's those Erickson Covenanters. They're the most grateful people I know. What if that became your identity as a church? When you go and you work with other church groups or you're, you're doing missional work in downtown Creston, whatever, uh, if you find your, ha- oh, hey, you must go to that Erickson church because you're really kind. You're really, you're really grateful people. Why do we need to remember is because it leads us to gratitude. I have, a, I have a final story. I actually don't know how long I've been preaching for. Ho. I, 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 I kind of lost track, but I got to find. What? Pardon? You're way, shorter than way shorter than Tom. Okay. I don't know if that's good or bad, but um, I want to leave with a story. Now, do you guys know the story of the 10 lepers, right? What's the story of the 10 lepers? What happens? They get healed. They get healed. Okay. Yeah. So 10 lepers come to Jesus. He heals them. And then what, what, what happens after that? Only one comes back. Okay? So one comes back to say thank you. Now, if you actually look at the definition, the word sozo is what they say. Your faith has made you sozo. Okay? And so one of the translations of that word sozo is whole. Okay? So I want you to think about this. Whole, like W-H-O-L-E. Ten people that day received healing, but only one received wholeness. And why did he receive wholeness? He came back to say thank you. It's in our gratitude that we get to enter into wholeness. So why do we need to remember? We need to remember that Jesus walks with us. He's not abandoned us. And we need to remember because when we actually look back, It helps us to move forward, no matter the circumstances and situations we find ourselves in. Father, I thank you this morning to be able to be here with this group and to share with them. Father, I pray that this is an encouragement for them. Lord, I thank you that you have walked with me. Lord, through the hardships, you've delivered me, that I am still here. You've never left me. You've never abandoned me. Lord, I thank you that you've never left us this morning. Everyone here, you never abandon us. You are with us. May this be an encouragement, no matter the situations we find ourselves in, that you are with us. Amen.